This next talk is by both, um, or Tara, you have a little bit that you're going to talk about too. Um, but uh, yeah, a little bit. Okay. But we're going to start out with Mason Brock. Um, I keep hearing wonderful things about him. I knew him when he was an undergraduate at EKU, and he is way, 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 way better of a botanist than I am. So I'm excited to hear a little bit more about what he's been up to. Um, so um, Mason, you're at the, let's see, at Austin P, right? That's right. Right. Yep. Let's, why don't you take it away? <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everybody. And so uh, let me know if you have any sort of audio or graphical issues here. Uh, before we get too far in the presentation. Um, let me go on and start screen sharing. Let's see here from Currents. How about this? Is that working for everybody? Yeah. Good, 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 good. Okay, so let me start from the top again. I'm Mason Brock here at Austin Peay State University. And we are an herbarium, which as a lot of you know already is an archive of plant material. And part of my job here is uh, to process incoming, incoming specimens that we get. And uh, I'll, part of that, we have discovered many interesting species new for Kentucky in the herbarium specimens. And so I wanna emphasize when I'm talking about new, exciting Kentucky botanical discoveries, everything I'm talking about today is not a new species to science like Alan Weekly was talking about in his talk before. These are instead species discovered for the first time or maybe the second or third time within the political boundaries of Kentucky. And that is still a very interesting, uh, important thing to map where these species are. Really knowing where the species are is a big part of the battle for conservation. Uh, we can't conserve uh, what we don't know. And uh, just the very basic question of what grows where is absolutely fundamental to all of conservation. There are so many sites that are, are have extremely rich diversity, which if it wasn't almost by happenstance that some botanist stumbled into them, or maybe not happenstance, but perhaps a dedicated search to find them, the, those species would not even be known to be in the region. So I'm going to first show you this map from John Cartes on uh, the Biota of North America program website. And if you're like me, you look at this map and you get really excited because what this map shows is each county's approximate percentage of completeness. And that is the approximate number of species which we think are in the county and versus the number that have been found. So for those of you who know Kentucky really well, you might be looking at your home county. Let's say you're in Jefferson County in Louisville and you see a 98 or if you're in Fayette County in Lexington, you also see a 98. Uh, that is approaching 100% completion. And uh, even uh, the 100 in Madison County, uh, if there has uh, a county with no less than two herbaria, that would be uh, Berea College and EKU, would have the highest percent in the state. But really for the Eastern US in general, Kentucky is remarkably low, which means there's a lot left to discover. There's a lot of um, as, the, as the saying goes, a lot of meat on the bones still for a botanist out there looking to make interesting discoveries. Uh, there are a couple of areas which have uh, notable gaps. Uh, so I'm going to highlight one area, and that would be uh, Northeast Kentucky. We can see a lot of uh, counties in the 20s and 30s and 50s and 40s there as far as percentage goes. Any botanist in Northeast Kentucky is going to have a field day so unfortunately, I am in the opposite part of the state. I am located in Clarksville, Tennessee, which is uh, on the Tennessee-Kentucky line in what sort of the uh, southwestern, south central part of the state, uh, just west, southwest of Bowling Green. And we also have a lot of counties that have potential, especially along the Tennessee-Kentucky line. Uh, I'm just gonna rattle off a few counties. You may not know all of these, but uh, we can see we got uh, Simpson County at 37, uh, Monroe County at 39. Um, it looks like, uh, is that uh, Cumberland County at 37? There's a lot of areas uh, in the southern part of the state also that need exploration. And so there are two main ways that uh, new species for Kentucky are, or new species in any state are discovered. And it's pretty straightforward. You can do it through herbarium specimens. 
that is us you look at a specimen and it's either been not identified or misidentified and you identify it and that would be a new record or you do on the ground exploration and so the records which uh, me and other botanists have found over the past five years or so have been a combination of this um it is true that most of our new specimens uh, undescribed taxa of science are now being found through herbarium specimens. But as far as county records, that's still mostly just on the ground exploration. We need more boots on the ground. We need people out there um, braving the ticks, braving the, braving the heat, uh, braving the rain, and uh, braving uh, knocking on doors to ask permission, uh, even in houses that may not look too friendly. Uh, we need people doing, doing the legwork. And so here's an example of a uh, species, which I can't claim credit for finding, but just some great species for on the ground exploration, mountain maple. You know, uh, here's, a, here's a record from a cave entrance at Buck Creek, Pulaski County. Uh, we need people on the ground finding these things. So let me first start with herbarium specimens. So I'm located, like I said, in Ossipee State University. Now you may be wondering, why in the world is somebody located in Tennessee talking about Kentucky botany? Well, the truth is Austin P is a Kentucky-based herbarium. We are physically located in Tennessee, but we have more Kentucky specimens than we do Tennessee specimens. We have about 51,000 herbarium specimens from Kentucky compared to only 38,000 Tennessee specimens. Um, I need to double check this before I say it too often, but I think we may be the largest Kentucky majority herbarium in the United States. Uh, although EKU may, may be uh, at least extremely close to us on that. The reason we have so many Kentucky based, uh, we have so many Kentucky specimens is that about um, five years ago, we acquired all of the Western Kentucky University material, the material from the former Louisville herbarium and the Max Medley private collection of his all his Kentucky specimens just in the past four years, which doubled our size. And uh, in total was about 68,000 specimens and the vast majority of it coming from Kentucky. So I threw a name out there, Max Medley. Uh, let me just briefly tell you about Max, who he is and why he is the source of so many of the new Kentucky records of, that we've discovered uh, in the herbarium. Uh, Max uh, is retired and lives in Georgia, but he, uh, when he was in Kentucky, was one of the most prolific Kentucky collectors in the latter half of the 20th century. Uh, from about 1978 to 1993, he amassed a private collection of by our estimates 22,000 specimens, which is uh, the size of some public herbaria. And uh, it's not just uh, that he was collecting just roadside weeds, he really did target species that are both rare or disjunct or of uh, taxonomically difficult groups. And so you go through medley specimens and it's just specimen after specimen is of, highly in of a high botanical interest. And so of course, we're going to find many interesting species uh, within, within his private collection. This was a very difficult task to process. Uh, Max Medley um, is not joining us on this conference uh, because he is extremely old school and does not use a computer in any way, shape, or form. And so as such, uh, his uh, specimens, uh, notebooks were handwritten and uh, we just acquired them. And so I had to uh, transcribe his labels from the handwritten notebooks and mount the specimens. WKU um, did a good job, but uh, did not have a dedicated funding source to process his specimens. After being at WKU for 20 years, only about 25% of Max Medley's specimens had been processed. And so we really um, tried to put our uh, the pedal to the gas on that when they arrived at Austin P. And at this point, uh, approximately 98% have been processed. There are a few loose ends uh, we are actually missing his 1994 notebook. So if anybody um, can locate that, let us know. Um, so let's go through some of the species from WKU that, uh, that not just Max, but other botanists had, have found. And so the, the species I'm presenting are all either new records or highly significant records uh, that have just come to light in the past four or five years or so. 
I didn't quite know when a good cutoff would be, but I feel like four or five years is a good cutoff for when a record is no longer no longer fresh enough to present at a conference like this. So let's we're going to get kind of in the weeds here, but I know a lot of you people are botanists, so you're going to enjoy this part of the presentation. So I'm just going to go through species by species, some of the really cool finds that we found. So the first one is actually not by Max Medley, but by a, a person named G.P. Johnson in 1980. And they were doing a, a complete flora of a small cedar glade located uh, within the city limits of Bowling Green. And uh, they collected uh, this origeron. And in 1980, you would have called this origeron strigosis, uh, ra a rather boring collection for a limestone cedar glade. They probably uh, rolled their eyes when they collected it. They were like, oh God, we gotta, we gotta at least document this origeron strigosis for this cedar glade. But of course, now we know um, uh, through the more uh, advanced taxonomy, that this is Origeron alisonii, uh, the only known specimen of this cedar glade endemic ever documented within the state of Kentucky, and I believe the northernmost known record. And uh, until recently, uh, this was considered a variety of strigosis, which would have been called Origeron strigosis variety uh, calcicola, I believe. But at the species name, it's it's now Origeron alisonii, just described by Brian Keener, I believe, in the past um, two or three years. And uh, you can see it has a different growth habit. It's a perennial. It has these uh, sort of uh, very sh uh, short rhizomes branching off from the base. Uh, when you, As soon as I was flipping through the incoming WQ specimens, as soon as I saw this, I realized what a significant discovery it was. Um, and uh, I've been to this site and uh, not been able to relocate the plants. And my understanding from historical aerial flyover, flyover photography is that um, the, um, hold on, the lights went out behind me here. There it is. Uh, is that the cedar glade has declined in size by about perhaps two thirds since 1980. Remember it's in the city limits of Bowling Green. Uh, there's currently an unfinished road leading directly into the Cedar Glade. Uh, so someone really needs to go here and find this thing. Oh, when I said I visited the site, I actually visited the site before I knew that this uh, Ridgeron Alisonii was there. So I wasn't really looking for it. Um, the site has not been revisited since uh, the discovery of Ridgeron Alisonii within Bowling Green. So that's that's a huge find for Kentucky, a uh, possibly um, uh, Cedar Glade endemic taxon, very cool. Uh, so the next are some of Max Medley's great finds. And uh, Max Medley, even though he may not have identified things to the species level, he knew it was interesting. He knew he had something. So this is one of those cases where he collected this beak sedge, Rhincospora gracilenta. Um, he only identified it as Rhincospora. Uh, it's a pretty technical group. Uh, you need um, you need good floras, you need a microscope to identify it. Uh, so I uh, examined this specimen and found out pretty quickly this is a new species for Kentucky, Rhincospora gracilenta. Uh, this is a species, this is a genus primarily known from the southeastern coastal plain where it's very, the genus is very diverse. We don't have too many species here in Kentucky, so it's good to see, good to see one. And it's right where you would expect it to be, the very southern Kentucky border of the Cumberland Plateau in McCreary County, which is our hotbed for a lot of these boggy, uh, acid, uh, open pine savanna type uh, species. So this is exactly where you'd expect to see it. And if you want to find this in the field, you really, it's not too hard. You don't need a microscope. You could just look for kind of long, thin, wispy, arching growth, and also in a uh, sandy, boggy habitat. And uh, you, you probably uh, will find Rhincospora gracilenta. Here's another example. The site has not been revisited uh, since we found this specimen. Uh, it's a little far away from me here at Austin P, but uh, I would love for somebody, some botanist Tara, to go there <laughs> and uh, find this thing. Uh, so, so some specimens um, are found in herbaria. Uh, but others have been coming to us in new and exciting ways, which they did not come before. So social media has really changed uh, the way plant records are being discovered. Uh, that would be both state records and county records. Uh, it, it is some ways it is democratizing uh, the mapping of rare species. And so it's no longer us 
botanists, uh, botanists in our um, either either in our state agencies or our herbarium um, hideaways who are doing these discoveries. Uh, people, anybody with internet access and an iPhone can make discoveries. And we've had a lot of interesting discoveries by one particular person I'm going to give a shout out to, a Mr. Frank Lynn of Logan County. He is a farmer and nature enthusiast. Um, he, uh, in his um, upper age, has really de dedicated a lot of time and effort to both birding and to botany. And um, just with his postings in Facebook and iNaturalist, we have made three significant discoveries of for Kentucky in the past two or three years. So I'm going to highlight all three of those um, as well. Oh, and just just a quick mention. Um, speaking of um, how uh, the internet is changing things, um, as of this summer, uh, Austin P is now completely online, so you can view all of our specimens. More more ways the internet has is democratizing access to botanical knowledge. So let's start with the, with the first species of what I'm calling Frank Lynn's Logan County gold mine. And this would be Trillium staminium, a new trillium for Kentucky. And when I uh, met Frank in person, he mentioned that he believed he had three different species of trillium on his property, which I, you know, I'm thinking of the trillium that would be in Logan County. And that makes sense to me. I didn't really, um, didn't really raise any red flags that he would have three species of trillium. And so we're taking the spring walk through the woods and he shows me the first trillium, uh, which is uh, trillium uh, staminium. And then he's, I'm sorry, sorry, no, no, the first trillium is trillium cuneatum. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty normal. Then he shows me some trillium flexipes. And then he shows me what he says is, tr he, he believes to be trillium recurvatum. And uh, it is actually this, it, it's a new, new trillium for Kentucky, uh, the northernmost known populations. It's found on uh, mesic limestone bluffs of the Red River watershed and some of its tributaries. And uh, at first I thought this would be a very local uh, kind of a fluke thing here in uh, Logan County, but in the past two springs, I have hit these watersheds hard and found that it is surprisingly common in Kentucky. I've got it now in uh, Todd County as well, and it's almost certainly in neighboring Simpson County. Uh, the issue is um, uh, these corridors of uh, calcareous forest have been very poorly botanized in the past, and they're located um, entirely on private land, except for a single small park, small city park in uh, Stewart County. And so really all it took was um, botanists uh, venturing into these new new areas for the first time to make discoveries. Uh, the second and probably really the most important as far as global conservation find in, in Franklin's Logan County gold mine is this, uh, is this uh, tick tree foil called Desmodium ochrolucum. Uh, there is a lot of Desmodium diversity uh, in, in this region. And so uh, good, good for uh, Frank and his eagle eye for noticing something was different about this Desmodium that he saw. And first off, uh, the place where he was looking, uh, he knew was a um, some sort of uh, xeric, maybe uh, maybe sub sub dry uh, prairie remnant of sorts. We had species such as Desmodium sessilifolium and Asclepius uh, viridiflora, and so already those were sort of been like, oh, there could be something here, and indeed there was. Uh, this is not a new record for Kentucky. It was found just a two or three years before for the first time in uh, the Mammoth Cave area. So uh, he, uh, we just missed that one, but it is the second record for Kentucky. And uh, perhaps most interestingly, the first record for the entire Big Barrens, Penny Royal Plain uh, region proper, excluding the uh, more dissected hilly uh, areas around Mammoth Cave. It is only the uh, second record in the flat karst Penny Royal Plain region since 1942. We have one herbarium specimen here at Austin P uh, collected uh, from south of the state line in Tennessee from that region uh, in the early 1940s, which we'd always wondered, uh, you know, uh, what kind of habitat it grew in, um, where exactly it was. There was very poor, very poor information on the label, but the specimen was undeniable. And so this is a G3 globally rare taxa discovered by um, Frank simply posting on Facebook, uh, I need some help with this Desmodium ID. 
and it snowballed from there. And then the third species in Frank's Logan County gold mine uh, is a little, a little bit of a more complicated backstory. Uh, this is uh, Hydrophilum virginianum. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that this is only the second verified herbarium specimen for Kentucky since 1908. And the primary reason for that is um, as of uh, Weekly's 2020 flora, um, it is perhaps suggested to treat the Appalachian entities as a distinct species named Hydrophilum atranthum. Uh, distinguished by its deeper purple flowers and more pubescent stems. And this is still a rare species for the state, but there are numerous records from the Pine and Cumberland, Black Mountain area, including some of the more dissected gorges around the Big South Fork. Um, so once you segregate uh, the more Appalachian hydrophilum, you're left with uh, this other species of hydrophilum, which is more of a Midwestern taxa. And uh, once, once you split them out that way, this may be the second collection only record uh, for Kentucky that Frank found again by using iNaturalist. Uh, this species in Kentucky is plagued with what I'm calling um, floristic hearsay, uh, that is unverified site records, offhand references, and other uh, just obscure reports without uh, anything uh, to verify, which is important because um, at least some of the specimens I've seen of this are misidentified as a Facilia bipinnatifida. So uh, no less than five counties have potential records that are either unverified or maybe unverifiable. And th those would be some bluegrass counties such as Anderson, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Woodford, but also some Western Kentucky counties such as Henderson and McCracken. Um, one of these is actually an iNaturalist record, um, but uh, there are uh, strange uh, circumstances around it, which I really want to see it in the field before I believe it to be true. So some of the other uh, new or new-ish finds for Kentucky. Um, so we, this is the part of the uh, about native plants, but there is always, as Alan mentioned, the question of nativity. And so some of our records, if you find it new for the state, you may not always know, is this really a new native species or is this uh, something else? So here are basically the three options you have when you find what appears to be a new species for the state. Is the species native and simply overlooked by past botanists? Is the species native and naturally and recently expanding its range? You know. Uh, when you have uh, hundreds of species for a flora, you would expect over some amount of time, at least some of them could be naturally expanding their range, probably not too many, but it's something to consider. And then the third option, is this native elsewhere in the US, but only expanding into the state in disturbed or unnatural habitats? And we have a fancy word for that as botanists called adventive. So here's an example of a uh, species and Houstonia micrantha, I found this for the first time uh, in Kentucky about two years ago in the vicinity of Mammoth Cave National Park. It looks a whole lot like Houstonia pusilla, but it is not pubescent. It's an annual and its flower is pure white and it's kind of a daintier, shorter, succulent looking thing. So this is a very small species. That's my finger right there. You can see how small it is. It's a very small annual. It has a pretty brief bloom window. Um, so that would be one uh, way to think, well, maybe it's just nat native and overlooked. But then again, I found it just in a mode area where kind of a, the lawn of a park or a cem and a cemetery. So that'd be maybe, uh, maybe it's not native. But then again, the mode area was right by a disturbed sandy barren habitat. What do you do with this question? You know, my guess is this is either native native or expanding or merely adventive. Uh, we just need more, more data to answer that question. For other species though, um, that are uh, interesting new discoveries, uh, they have uh, different, um, uh, different circumstances. So here on the left, you can see a Mausolinum butleri. Until 2017, uh, this Western species was unknown or practically unknown in the state. Uh, since then, I've documented it in six Kentucky counties all in the Big Barrens region. 
Uh, but every record is from a highly disturbed park or roadside, usually in closely mowed areas. Um, in fact, I found this species in my front yard this spring. Uh, not a good sign for it being a native component of the flora. My verdict, not a true Kentucky native, uh, only adventive from the far western part of the state. Uh, another uh, interesting taxa is uh, Nemophila aphyla. This is long known to be native in the far western part of the state along the Mississippi River Bluffs, but this spring I discovered it in two counties in the Big Barrens region, uh, Todd and Logan in the Pennyroyal Plain, uh, quite a bit uh, disjunct uh, east from where it was previously known in the state. One site is on roadside gravel, uh, but the other is on a limestone bluff growing with spring ephemerals such as Cardamony dissecta. You don't normally see an adventive species growing on a mesic limestone bluff with spring ephemerals. My verdict is native to South Central Kentucky and overlooked. Hi, Mason. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, we have a lot of people on the meeting and we were supposed to end at two. Are you close to wrapping up? I'm extremely close to wrapping up. Excellent. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. That's fine. Um, and then lastly, we have a, speci uh, a new species for Kentucky, which is not native, no doubt. Uh, this spring, I found, unfortunately, a Sertomium fortunii growing on the rocky bluffs of the Red River. It's an Asian fern. So uh, bad news. Well, I should probably wrap it up right there um, since we are running out of time. The last species of note is Visio minutiflora, the small flower vetch. And it was found right where the state line and the Cumberland River Bluff meets. And I thought to myself, hmm, maybe I should go look there, see what I find. And sure enough, look in the most obvious place. That's, the str that's my, that's my uh, pro tip for the day to find uh, rare species. There it was, uh, Visia minuta flora. Do you, uh, that was a quick, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, not too long uh, overview of some of the new and new-ish records for Kentucky over the past uh, three or four years. And I think I may have talked too long because I forgot that Tara was going to go a little bit too on this. Um, so we may have to take the questions for the chat. Uh, sorry about that, Tara. That's okay, Mason. I like hearing you talk way better than mine. Oh, you're too nice. <laughs> I was definitely taking notes because there was some things that we need to add to our database that you were mentioning. Yeah. Um, so we are running a little late. Um, I was just going to briefly mention three really cool plants that were discovered um, <clears throat> this year um, that, that we're really excited about. And, um, and I will speed through it. It won't take more than five-ish minutes. Um, and then we can wrap up the presentation or the symposium. So let's see, you got to stop your sh screen sharing in order for me to screen share, I think, Mason. This will, oh, this will stop, okay, I see. All this virtual button pushing is still, um, I'm still getting used to it. Okay, um, not what I wanted to start with. Why did this go to the first? Okay, so um, can everyone hear me? I cannot see anybody. Um, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so um, if you remember way back in the beginning of the symposium, Devin mentioned putting out some plots in some eastern highland rim wet uh, meadows, um, also called the zero hydric prairies. Um, and some nature preserve botanists have been looking at this area for several decades now. Um, it's very understudied. Most of it is private land and it's really agged up as well. Um, so I think a lot of the original NAI surveys for this Eastern Highland Rim area um, were not really um, uh, ex extensive just because of the, the private land situation and, and the extent of all the agriculture and just not knowing exactly 
what was really interesting there. So um, these green uh, polygons are, are I, I ran an analysis of soil type for these uh, zero hydric prairies, and, and this would have been the, ex the, the, the extent, the historic extent of, of, of where they could have been. Um, and uh, Not moving to my next slide. Okay. Thank, um, I'll, there's a historic map from the late 1700s by, by James Thames um, that uh, indicates these glade areas. And, and if anyone knows uh, of, of Hazeldale, it's open to the public. It's a, it's a county site. It, it has the only protected uh, remnant of these uh, zero hydric prairies. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Martina Hines, ecologist at Nature Preserves, who um, discovered uh, the second highest quality site of, of zero hydric prairies um, several decades ago with, with sundews, um, and also for sharing her love of zero hydric prairies with me. So I've become obsessed with them over the past 10 years or so, um, and have also conducted uh, surveys with Martina at um, the Russell County site. So last year, um, we found a really high a high quality zero hydric prairie on private land. It was um, not known in previous NAI surveys, and um, it was a strange a series of events that led to this discovery. Tony Romano was with me. It was actually his first day at work. Um, and, uh, and it has a whole slew of really interesting species. So we went through the NAI process of, uh, or the, the heritage process of once we find something really cool and high quality, we try to protect it. Um, lots of landowner contacts and trying to find out who owns what and you know PVA, all that kind of stuff. Um, but really cool um, species composition. There was a county uh, record of Drosera intermedia um, so really cool stuff. So um, I continued on the side to conduct surveys of this area over the past year. And um, this year, just actually passed in, past, in July, um, I found a really cool um, state record uh, called Sebacea quadrangula, the four angled rose gentian. <laughs> Um, in one of these zero hydric prairies. It was really exciting and unexpected because it's showy and you would think that something really showy in a, in a sebacea at that um, would have been known. And, and this, uh, this record was actually the first time it has been documented west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, when I first found this, I sent it to Alan um, and Bruce Sora. So I uh, appreciate all of their help in, in identifications and verifications of this. Um, I remember sending it to Alan, this photo um, of my finger there, and him mentioning how I needed to really clean my fingernails. Um, so I really got to think about um, my, my hand shots with these uh, flower photos sometimes. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it, this site in particular really delves on the point of, of how, how um, tenuous these, these, these really important sites are. But, I found it in late July, and less than a week later, the majority of the site was mowed by the landowner. Um, before um, I could really meet with him to really delve into the importance of this site. So, um, you know, long story short, um, we've been working now with that landowner um, and some surrounding areas doing more surveys and doing a lot of the things that you heard in other talks um, like seed collection and propagation and trying to protect the site. So that's a really cool one that we're really excited about. Um, I'll mention two other ones. Um, if I can get my computer to... Nabalus barbatus. So that's a that is a record that was discovered um, by Devin Rogers uh, maybe a month ago. Um, so this is a site or this is a plant that was known from Kentucky. It's it's globally rare. 
um, and in the uh, Fort Campbell area, and we had not seen it for several decades, uh, despite some uh, efforts to look for it. So um, Devin was uh, was looking for specifically um, potentially for this plant. So he found it on a roadside, actually in a cemetery. So we're really excited. Uh, it was. Um, uh, labeled as, as extirpated in Kentucky. So we're really excited that, that this plant has uh, come back uh, from the dead. It was growing out of a cemetery. Um, Dwayne Estes and his crew at the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative have been doing a lot of work on this, this species in the Southeast. And, and oftentimes you see on this uh, left part of the slide, it's just vegetated. Uh, it's just in vegetation form in overgrown uh, uh, woods. It's a grassland species. So. Um, we're hoping to find more of that um, in the future. And then I will end um, with a new find, and this is also a tie to uh, iNaturalist. Um, so I uh, got an email from one of my friends, um, Laura Darnell, um, who is a botanist in uh, the Louisville area. Um, and she had found on uh, iNaturalist uh, Price's potato bean uh, record that she was pretty, she was thinking, yeah, this is, this seems like Price's potato bean. Um, it was uh, identified as the more common Apios americana. Um, so this is a federally listed species. This is a really rare, uh, uh, really rare species that only occurs in a couple of states. So we immediately, um, it, it's, it was definitely Apios Priciana. We reached out to um, Courtney who had uh, found it. And it's just a really interesting story that's kind of snowballing into, into different um, conservation uh, strategies. She found it um, on her property um, in the Bowling Green area along the Green River. And this is the first time that this species has been seen in that area uh, in over 100 years uh, since uh, Sadie Price first discovered it. So Sadie Price is a, uh, a famous uh, Kentucky botanist from the late 1800s. Um, so we're really excited about this record. Um, all of our other Price's potato bean records are in far Western Kentucky. So this is an extremely significant find. And it, I th it's gonna really um, increase our um, our inventories on the Green River over the next uh, couple of years for sure. So um, this is just a video of the Green River. Um, I spent several in the past couple of years uh, doing a lot of Green River surveys and, and, and riding on boats chasing eagles. So this is just a preview of what's to come looking for prizes potato bean over um, the next couple of years. Um, so I will end it at that. Um, and try to wrap up this meeting. Um, it's been an awesome event. Uh, I think that uh, we've had a lot of really great talks, um, lots of interested folks. Um, and yeah, let's uh, reach out if you wanna get more involved with Native Plant Society, visit our website, uh, reach out to na Nature Preserve folks if you wanna get involved in more of our projects. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, I apologize for running over 20 minutes and um, reach out to us. If next year, we're still gonna be doing this virtual thing uh, for a little while longer. So if you would like to see more of these types of webinars or, or anything like that, just let us know. Um, I think that that's probably where we're, what we're gonna be planning over the next at least six months, uh, a few more, not of a, a longer symposium, but maybe more of a, a shorter webinars. So thank you all for attending and I hope you all have a, a good uh, rest of your December.